from New York City, the makers of Clipper Craft Clothes for Men and 1036 leading retail stores from coast to coast present the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> this week's adventure, the case of the ever-blooming roses. Well, here we are again in Dr. Watson's delightful study. Just outside the open window, a black-winged penobler is singing his even song from a branch thick with blossoms. We would say it is heavy with May, Mr. Harris. It's the charming custom in England to refer to all the lovely flowering that bursts into bloom at this time as the May. Of course I never thought of it, Dr. Watson, but that must be where this month gets its name. Right. In the British Isles, May is also a very charming and popular feminine given name. Yes, I think I'll tell you of a particularly lovely young thing called May who narrowly escaped death, and all because of a spray of yellow roses that refused to wither. Sounds quite poetic, Dr. Watson. Macabre would be a better description, Mr. Harris. It all occurred in May. May, when nature sheds its winter garment. Yes, and nature isn't the only one to feel that urge, I gather. <laughs> I was wondering how long it would take you to notice my new spring outfit. Well, you know, I noticed it the minute I came in the door. The fit, the quiet authority that's achieved only with good tailoring and fine materials. You know, all the talk about high prices doesn't affect you at all if you wear Clippercraft clothes. Yes, if you wear Clippercraft, you haven't a worry in the world about getting the most for your money. You're certain of long-wearing fabric, superb tailoring, and smart style. You've always been sure of these from Clippercraft, but today... Clippercraft's old-fashioned values are all the more remarkable. They're made possible by the famous Clippercraft plan, concentrating the buying power of 1036 of the nation's finest stores from coast to coast, providing steady year-round operation, reducing manufacturing and distribution costs, and putting the savings in your pocket. If you've never worn Clippercraft, we guarantee you the finest suits you've ever seen for only 40 and 47.50. Luxurious tropicals from thirty-three seventy-five to forty dollars, and handsome sport jackets at only twenty-six fifty. So join the millions who enjoy Clippercraft clothes. Compare Clippercraft with clothes selling for many dollars more. Now, Doctor, back to the charming lady who was named for this verdant month. May. Yes, it was rather late in May, as I remember. The year was 1909 or 10, I believe. Holmes had retired to a small property he'd acquired on the coast of Sussex and was deep in bee culture. <laughs> Leaving you alone and deserted. <laughs> Except for a delightful and devoted little wife. Yes, exactly. Well, to begin at the beginning, I had uh, I'd gone down to Sussex for a long weekend of fresh air and relaxation. <laughs> You might have known better than to expect relaxation around Sherlock Holmes, Doctor. Oh, how right you are, Mr. Harris. Well, it was Saturday morning. Holmes and I were finishing a leisurely breakfast which had been served up on the east terrace overlooking the channel. I had just filled my pipe and was offering my tobacco pouch to Holmes when, to my surprise, he refused. Never touch the stuff. Never touch tobacco, Holmes, you prevaricator. When I think of the tons I've watched you consume, a regular inferno. Just the same, I've given it up. What, anything wrong with your health? No, I've given up nicotine because my bees don't like it, you know. You go out among the hives reeking of nicotine and see what happens to you, Watson. I have no intention of going near the silly things. Bees, my dear Watson, are not silly. If the human race conducted its affairs with half the discipline and intelligence... We'd have fewer fools like the latter-day Jehu, who is at this moment scorching up the cliff road in this direction. Uh, what? Oh, you mean the chap driving the automobile, I take it. Naturally. The blithering idiot must be courting death at close to 40 miles an hour. Holmes, he's coming in here. <laughs> Made the turn on two wheels. It's a wonder he missed the gatepost. Phew, look at the dust he's kicking up. Well, <laughs> at least he did manage to stop the juggernaut. Mm. For a moment, I thought he was going right on through the kitchen. Well, well, this is a bit of luck. I'd hope to see Holmes, of course, but to find Watson as well. My dear fellow, the pleasure's mutual. Isn't it, Watson? Huh? 
<laughs> you know, Holmes, I, I don't believe the old boy remembers me. How can I tell if I remember you or not, all done up in that cap and goggles? <laughs> My dear Dilly, you'll have to forgive Watson. I've never been able to teach him to recognize people by their immutable features, the shape of the ears, the set of the jaw. Dilly? Don't tell me it's old Peter Dillinghurst. Now the Reverend Dr. Dillinghurst, <laughs> rector of Basham Church, I believe. Yes, worse luck. That's what I've come to consult you about, Holmes. Things have been happening at Basham Church. Every morning, there were fresh roses on the late Lady Elfrida's tomb. And the old bell in the tower started to ring again. Well, but look here, Dillinghurst. People often place flowers on tombs, and church bells are quite frequently rung, you know. Yes, but the people didn't place the roses, Watson, and people didn't ring the bell. Matter of fact, the bell hasn't been rung for five years. Not since the time it was hit by lightning and badly cracked. The stairs to the bell tower were destroyed by fire at that time and never replaced. No one can reach the rope. Oh, well, then, what, 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 what? It's those confounded roses that are really the most disturbing phenomenon, Holmes. Basham Church is looked up. It's locked up every night after evensong. I attend to the locking up myself. Every night when I make the rounds to extinguish the candles, I notice the day's spray of yellow roses on Lady Elfrida's tomb. And every night they are faded and drooping. Well, yellow roses always seem to be particularly perishable, eh, Holmes? Don't interrupt, Watson. The next morning, when I unlock the door and air out the church, there are the roses, as fresh as though they'd just been plucked. And no one has set foot inside the church. Amazing, eh, Holmes? My dear Dillinghurst, what makes you so positive that no one had entered the church? I'm not a fool, Holmes. On several occasions, I have scattered ashes, not only around the doors, but around Lady Elfrida's tomb as well. There's never been so much as a mouse track through them. I joke. Furthermore, a group of schoolboys who've joined that New organization, uh, oh, what is it they call it? Oh, yes, the Boy Scouts. Oh, I've heard of them, Holmes. Remarkable lads. They can rub two sticks together and make a fire, don't you know? They're... They didn't invent the process. Go on, Rector. Well, as I was saying, the boys and their scoutmaster, the local librarian, volunteered to spend the night in Basham Church to see if they could find out who was responsible for the blooming roses and the ringing bell. What did they discover? Nothing, Holmes. Absolutely nothing. At exactly midnight, the bell rang and the roses bloomed afresh. Nobody, absolutely nobody, was within arm's reach of either. Why are you so perturbed about all this, Dilly? Because, well, because this occurrence is killing May, the present Lady Danesfield. May was the late rector's daughter, Holmes. I've known her since she was a child and I came to Basham to act as her father's curate. May is, of course, much younger than Sir Albert and Elfrida, his first wife. In fact, I think May was always afraid of Elfrida, who was a strange, cold throwback to her Danish ancestors. It's on Lady May's account that I ask you to investigate this matter, Holmes. Well, what do you say, Watson? Shall we take a run over to Basham, Dilly's newfangled perambulator? Uh, I'll go and get my coat and hat. Oh, you, you won't need them, Watson. I've brought along caps and dusters for both of you. Come along. We shall have to drive like the devil if we're going to get back in time for choir practice. I never realized the utter imbecility of barnyard fowl until I started to drive a car. Did he look out? There's a boy on a bicycle. Never touched him. Oh. Tell me, Dillinghurst, first about the church bell. You say it sounds at midnight. How often has this occurred? Every night since Lady Elfrida's birthday, the day those confounded yellow roses were placed on her tomb. That's nearly two weeks ago. Yellow roses. Is there any significance to yellow roses? Oh, yes, Holmes. Sir Albert Danesfield's first wife, the Lady Elfrida, came from Castle Odo, which is famous for its yellow roses. When the Lady Elfrida married Sir Albert, she brought along a half dozen of the rose bushes in the family gardener to plant them. What happened to him? Hugo, uh, that's his name, still lives at the hall, although he must be well over 80 by now. Oh. Well, he was always particularly devoted to Elfrida. And somehow he always managed, whether the season was early or late, to have those rose bushes covered with blossoms for Lady Elfrida's birthday. And every year, after his mistress died, on her birthday he'd bring a sheaf of yellow roses to Sir Albert, who'd carry them to Basham Church and place them on her tomb. But every year up to now the roses have withered in due course of time. Well, not every year, Holmes. That is, the, the Lady Elfrid has been dead over ten years. Oh? Three years ago, when Sir Albert decided to take a young wife, he... Well, you know how it is, he... 
He sort of neglected to keep up the custom of decorating his first wife's grave on her birthday. Thoughtless of him, eh, Holmes? Possibly. Well, this year on Elfrida's birthday, old Hugo stopped Sir Albert and his young wife as they came out to take their morning stroll in the gardens. Morning, Hugo. Oh, Hugo, how beautiful. Look, Albert, the lovely yellow roses. Are they for me, Hugo? No, ma'am. Begging your ladyship's pardon. They're for her whose birthday this is. They're for her who loved and tended them, and who lies in her grave in Basham Church, buried there before her time was due. That will do, Hugo. If you take my advice, sir, you'll not forget to take her the flowers she loved this day. The Lady Elfrida was not one to take a slight without getting her own back. Rubbish! You can't bully rag me, Hugo. Life is for the living. But we all must die sometime, Sir Albert. Give me the flowers, Hugo. I'll see they're placed on Lady Elfrida's grave. Thank you, ladyship. And may heaven protect you better than it did her. Really, May, my dear, this is a bit ridiculous. Oh, please, Albert. I'd like to put these on Elfrida's grave. They're beautiful this year, and it means so much to poor old Hugo. Are you sure that's why you're doing it, my dear? What do you mean? Are you sure it's not because you're still a bit afraid of Elfrida? Well, maybe it's for both reasons, Albert. That's the second time, Dillinghurst, that you've mentioned the Lady May was afraid of her predecessor. That's not as startling as it sounds, Holmes. Oh? Confound that man with his sheep. Does he have to take up the entire road? Oh, what was I saying? Oh, oh, yes. Everyone was terrified of Elfrida. She was a cold, forbidding sort of woman, even in her affections. She should have had children. That might have made a difference. You see, she knew how desperately her husband wanted them, and, well, when the years went by and there were no heirs to carry on, Albert turned rather cold towards her. Oh, unfeeling of him, eh, Holmes? Mm. I've often suspected that Lady Elfrida's drowning in Sea Creek that runs past the hall wasn't as accidental as we were led to believe. You mean, uh, you think it was suicide? There was no autopsy, I suppose. Oh, good Lord, no. They just pulled her out of the weeds. She'd been missing for three days before the grappling hooks found her. They were afraid she'd done away with herself when they found the note. What did it say? I have gone to answer the call. Mm. You say that May was always afraid of Lady Elfrida. What was the older woman's attitude toward the girl? Did she suspect her husband felt an attachment for her? Oh, good heavens, no. May was only 12 years old when Lady Elfrida drowned. She was 19 when Sir Albert asked her to be a second wife. You say they've been married three years. Are they happy? Mm, I suppose so. Of course, Sir Albert's disappointed again that there are no children. Mm, maybe it wasn't entirely the Lady Elfrida's fault the first time, eh, Holmes? Uh, don't interrupt, Watson. Then Sir Albert's family may die out with him. Don't oh, no, Holmes. There's Robert. Albert's brother, a half-brother, as a matter of fact. He's much younger, but he's rarely at home, always off hunting big game in India, Africa, some other outlandish place. He's, mm. he's just returned from Canada about six weeks ago. How does he get on with Sir Albert's new wife? Hardly has a word to say to her. Just keeps looking at her with those strange, black-burning eyes of his. His mother was Spanish, you know. They do say he takes after her. I say, look at that magnificent sunset there, over in back of that steeple. That's the steeple of Basham Church, Watson. We're nearly home. The town begins on the other side of the railroad tracks at the foot of the next decline. Would you care to drive to the church immediately, home? Oh, I say, Oh, no. control yourself, Watson. I know you're famished. Suppose we pay a visit to the local inn first, Dillinghurst, and postpone our investigation of Basham Church until the witching hour of midnight. Despite rising costs of materials and manufacturing, you still get the most for your money if you insist on Clippercraft clothes. Clippercraft's values are so remarkable that people constantly ask us how we do it. Well, the answer is the Clippercraft plan, which, from a production standpoint, simply has modernized the fine old craft of clothes making. It brings you these amazing savings by concentrating the buying power of 1,036 of the nation's finest stores from coast to coast your own leading local establishment, the store you can trust. When you see these remarkable suits at only 40 and 47.50, fine tropicals at only 33.75 to 40 dollars, 
and sport jackets at only $26.50. Why, you'll be high on Clipper Craft forevermore. For selling expensive clothes at inexpensive low prices at the nation's finest stores is the great big idea behind the Clipper Craft plan. That's why men who know insist on Clipper Craft clothes. So be sure to visit the Clipper Craft store in your city. These leading stores in the metropolitan area are proud to add their names to Clipper Craft in your suits, top coats, sport jackets, and tropicals. In Manhattan, Saks 34th, Broadway at 34th. John Watermaker Men's Stores, Broadway at 8th and 67 Liberty Street. In Brooklyn, Abraham and Strauss. In Newark, New Jersey, Boulevard Men's Shop, Kresge, Newark. And in Jamaica, the B&B Clothes Shop, 16408 Jamaica Avenue. Now back to Basham Churchyard. It is a few moments before midnight. The good rector, followed by two silhouettes, one tall and lank, the other rather more substantial, is picking his way through the moss-covered tombstones by the light of an old-fashioned lantern. Careful, Watson. One of the headstones has fallen over. Some of the graves are very old and their families have died out. The more important families, of course, have their tombs and vaults inside the church proper, where the local historical society cares for them. Dashed undemocratic, eh, Holmes? What difference does it make when you're dead? Uh, now, up these steps. Just a moment till I find the key to the side door. I see. Listen to the wind. Sounds like a lost soul. Here we are. I'll go first and light the way. Hinge could do with a bit of oil, Dillinghurst. Good Lord! Phew, something just swooped past my face. Probably a bat, Watson. Old churches are often inhabited by them. Yes, there's another hanging from that clear story up there. This way, Holmes. I see the old place looks much bigger and gloomier from the inside, eh, Holmes? Quite. Now we're standing directly under the belfry. If you look up, you can see the bell and the rotted end of the bell cord up there. Completely out of reach. He's right, Holmes. No human hand could ring that bell. That... Oh. Hello, I slipped on something. Yes, there seem to be quite a few pebbles here on the floor. Bits of masonry are always coming loose, I'm afraid. One of them rather ruined the postmistress Easter bonnet. The Danesfield bolts up this way, to the left of the chancel. Basham Church is one of the oldest in all England. Here at the entrance to the choir lies the daughter of Canute, folded in her golden hair. It's still growing, they say. Every hundred years or so, they open up the tomb and cut a length of it off. I say, do you believe that? I don't know, Watson. I wasn't here at Basham at the beginning of the century. I'll let you know in the year 2000. Hmm. At that ancient altar, Harold knelt before setting sail on his ill-fated voyage to Normandy. Here we are. The entrance to the Danesfield vault. One of the oldest family vaults in the entire church. It was completely filled long ago. The more recent members have been buried in the floor beside it. This is Lady Elfrida's tomb, here. With the wilted roses lying against the wall. Yes. Give me that lantern, Rector. Holmes, what are you doing with your stick? Testing the wall behind Elfrida's grave. Yes, quite solid. And the door leading down into the vault. This hasn't been opened for years, I should say. No rust or dust on the grating... The grill works sound as the day it was made. Mm, those old dames could teach us a thing or two about ironwork, eh, Holmes? Yes. Suppose we take up our places in the first pew over there. It's nearly midnight. We may as well wait in comfort for this phenomenon of the roses. No, uh, I have the strangest feeling that someone is watching us. Considering all the ancestors who lie buried here, is it any wonder? Oh, Holmes, really, you... Sit down, Watson, and stop fidgeting. Let's see. Twenty seconds to midnight... This church is, of course, one of the old foundation. That's right, Holmes. Ten seconds. The important thing is to watch the roses. Don't take your eyes off them. Five seconds. I hope this occurs on time. Three seconds. Two. One. Now. Midnight exactly. Holmes, look at the roses. They're fresh. They're absolutely blooming. Why, so they are. Let's have a look at them. 
Did either of you take your eyes off them? Well, uh, just for a second, perhaps, when the bell rang. I'm afraid I'm guilty of that lapse as well. Lucky I was along, assuring us of at least one person who can concentrate. Yes, these roses are as fresh as they look. Remarkable. I think I'll take this one along for my buttonhole. Oh, Miss Lucas. Tomorrow morning, Rector, I think we shall take a look at the bushes that are supposed to have produced these very remarkable roses. That can be arranged, Holmes. Excellent. You know, Watson, there's only one thing more remarkable than the freshness of this rose. What's that? The time it chose to renew itself. But it was midnight exactly as the rector told us. That's right, Holmes. You yourself said it was midnight by your own watch. That's what makes it so remarkable, my dear rector. You see, my watch is five minutes fast. <laughs> Very good of you, Mr. Holmes, to take such an interest in our little problem of the everlasting roses. But after all, I imagine a person of your uh, reputation has many more important uh, crimes to investigate. It's not the importance of a case that interests me primarily, Sir Albert. The Shah of Persia might be murdered in cold blood in Trafalgar Square, and I should probably pass by without a glance. But if a well-known member of a county family should, uh, shall we say, go about popping off his neighbor's top hats with... A slingshot? I might just possibly consider that worth investigating. <laughs> what a droll fellow you are, Mr. Holmes. Am <laughs> I, Sir Albert? Uh, oh, yes, here we are. Uh, these are my former wife's yellow rose bushes, Mr. Holmes. Now quite bare of blossoms, as you can see. I thought they might be. Yes, let me see. Yes, basically a rugosa with a later grafting of something... Yes, I rather imagine the rose these bushes produce resembles that early flowering yellow rose now called the Father Hugo. Why, yes, Mr. Holmes, that's absolutely correct. Uh, by the way, Sir Albert, you have a gardener named Hugo. Oh, yes, yes, poor old Hugo. He's failing fast, I'm afraid. This business of the yellow roses is preying on his mind almost as much as on my wife's. Uh, my favorite rose is a Frau Druschke, which blooms about now. It's a pure white rose, as you know. And should remain so. Uh, I, I agree. I, I quite agree. Uh, people who are forever crossbreeding and grafting... Oh, Robert, I... are you sure? Are you sure you didn't hear it? Last night it called again, just shortly before dawn. It, it was down by the bend of the Sea Creek where, where they found Elfrida. It, it, it was a woman's voice and, and it kept calling my name. I, I had an almost irresistible urge to go to it. What rotten, eh? You must have been dreaming. It wasn't the first time I heard that voice. It, it called to me three nights ago. Oh, Robert, I, I was terrified. I knocked on Albert's door, but he didn't answer. Then I knocked on yours, but you didn't hear me either. And all the time, that, that voice kept calling to me. The men in this household must be remarkably heavy sleepers. Robert, who's that? Some confounded eavesdropper on the other side of the head. Uh, me, my dear. Uh, come round the hedge here a moment and uh, bring Robert. Uh, I want you to meet two distinguished guests, Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson, uh, my wife and my half-brother, Robert. We've come to solve the riddle of the yellow roses. Oh, no! No! Leave her alone! Leave her alone, all of you! Why you drag me out here, Holmes, to sit in this Blasted insect ridden duck blind in the middle of the night. Dead rat, the blasted things. Oh, it's not even the duck hunting season. Exactly. Our object, my dear Watson, is to discover who and why someone's trying to frighten the Lady May out of her wits. Well, then you don't agree with her husband and her brother in law that the voice calling to her from the water was only a dream? The ringing bell and the ever blooming roses weren't a dream, Watson. Very well, then why not solve that mystery first? Oh, but it is solved, Watson. It's been solved since five minutes to midnight last night. How so? I was quite convinced that the trick of the bell and the roses were not two, but one. Any sleight of hand artist knows that the important thing is to divert his audience's attention at the moment his stunt is pulled. Hence the bell. Oh, I don't understand. My dear Watson, those smooth pebbles, one of which unbalanced you, those were what rang the bell. They were projected by a noiseless weapon, in short, a powerful slingshot. Our sleight-of-hand artist aimed his pebble through the grating of the Danesfield family vault. A second later, he shoved the fresh roses through with his foot as he picked up the old ones with his hand. Very quick, very neat. But how did he get inside of the vault? You saw the ashes around the entrance. There were no footprints but ours. Basham Church, as I said before, belongs to the old foundation. 
The Danesfield vault was undoubtedly used as a priest's hole during the religious wars. There's another entrance from the fields directly under the chancel. And you deliberately tricked the fellow into going off half cocked five minutes ahead of time? <laughs> Holmes, you are a wonder. Yes, I rather imagine there'll be no further nonsense in Basham Church. But that doesn't mean that Lady May is out of danger. The roses were meant to terrify her, you know. The poor woman's on the verge of a nervous breakdown, or worse. Well, then, why not let me take over? No, Watson. Not until we can prove who it is who's threatening her. By Jove, of course. The brother. He wants her out of the way so there can be no possible heir except himself. The roses, by the way, were white roses dyed yellow, inasmuch as the yellow rose bushes had ceased to... May! May! Come to me! May! Good Lord, Holmes, did you hear that? Yes, I suspected as much. It's coming from the marshes on the other side of the stream. The tide's high now. The stream's deep. He would wait for that. May, May. Here she comes now. The Lady May. She's all in white, Holmes. She looks as if she were sleepwalking. Look, she's heading for that boat tied to the landing. Yes. Yes. Now someone's following her into the shadows. It's Robert, the half-brother. He's carrying a gun. Holmes, we must stop him before he does her any harm. Leave him alone, Watson. He knows what he's doing. May. The Lady May's getting to the rowboat. She's pulling it out into the stream. She's in trouble, Holmes. Yes. There were fresh holes bored just above the waterline. When she stepped into the boat, it started to fill. Help me! Somebody! Help! Holmes, we must save her. It's all right, May. I'm coming. Relax, Watson. Robert's going after her. The situation is well in hand. <laughs> That's what I was waiting for. But... Now, Watson, we can go home. But you heard that scream. And then we shot over there in the marsh. Right. It was Sir Albert who was luring his second wife to her death by the same means he used to do away with his first. He was shot by the one person who suspected that death was not suicide. When he saw him tried again, he killed him. But Robert couldn't have shot his brother Holmes. He left his gun on the bank when he went to rescue the Lady May. Right, Watson. Yes, I think that when Sir Albert's body is discovered, it will be found he was shot by his own fowling piece at close range. The coroner will probably decide... It was a hunting accident. Well, the Lady May was rescued, I take it, Doctor. Oh, yes, Mr. Harris. But why did her husband want to do away with her? Because she, like his first wife, had produced no sons. And because he suspected his brother had fallen in love with her. As a matter of fact, the Lady May married Sir Robert, and in due course of time, they had five bouncing offspring, all boys. Well, good for her. But, Doctor, who did shoot Sir Albert? Well, Holmes took no interest whatever in solving that mystery. Of course, I always had my suspicions. Uh, you mean the old boy who had the same name as the Yellow Roses? Possibly, Mr. Harris, possibly. I see. Uh, and now, Dr. Watson, what story are you going to tell us next week? Now, uh, let me see. Next week, I think I'll tell how Sherlock Holmes outwitted two of Europe's most famous jewel thieves and confidence tricksters by beating them at their own game on the platform at Waterloo Station. Yes, the story concerns a missing parrot and a lady who played a nasty trick on me by means of her false teeth. I call it the case of the accommodating valise. Makers of Clipper Craft Clothes and 1036 leading stores from coast to coast have brought you another in the new series of broadcasts featuring the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. Our stories are based upon the character Sherlock Holmes, created by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Sherlock Holmes is played by John Stanley, Dr. Watson by Alfred Shirley, and the dramatizations are by Edith Miser. Sherlock Holmes is produced and directed by Basil Lochran with special music by Albert Berman. If you don't know your Clipper Craft dealer, write Clipper Craft, 200 Fifth Avenue, New York City. Be sure to listen next week to Sherlock Holmes in The Case of the Accommodating Police. Hi, Harris, speaking for Clipper Craft Clothes. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.